these are the glory days of website design. It's not like the old days when you had to glue cat toys to your nipple, cover your groin and chest and stomach with salmon scent and lay in a dark alley in the website district of your town, making those quivering, mewling sounds that would hopefully summon a web designer who would look at the cat toys, size them up, and based on the web designer's personality, accept them or reject them by slapping you as hard as he could in the neck. This was a nightmare, and if you did find a great web designer who accepted your offering, then it was likely they would overcharge or take too long to build the website or 50% of the time go completely insane and murder your family. These days are long gone, thank God. I don't mean to summon up dark memories for those of you who remember these horrific times, because now you can go to squarespace.com and they have everything you need to start building a beautiful website today. They've got shopping cart functionality so you can start selling your clay figurines or sweaty socks online. They've got beautiful templates created by world-class designers that you can pick and choose from to assemble an incredible website. Not only that, but Squarespace sizes to any device. You don't have to worry about that. And they now have the ability to do email campaigns so you can send data out to your millions of subscribers. I've got a new bag of socks, folks. Squarespace, it's an amazing service. And if you want to see an example of one of the most beautiful websites your eyes have ever seen, go to DuncanTrussell.com. That is a Squarespace website. So try them out. Go to squarespace.com forward slash Duncan. And when you're ready to launch, use offer code Duncan and you will get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Thank you, Squarespace. Before I forget, pals, on June 7th, I'm going to be doing a, I guess you could call it a podcast. It's a conversation with David Nickturn, who's been teaching me, uh, med- who's my meditation teacher at the Samsara Center in Echo Park. He's awesome. And I love chatting with him. I'm going to be there on June 7th, but he is doing a mindfulness meditation teacher training program. If you want to get your mind blown by someone who's in one of the wildest lineages of Buddhism ever, then this is definitely a great course for you to take. Okay, loves, without further ado, I present to you one of the funniest storytellers walking the face of the earth today. If you want to see a great comedy special, check out Me Being Me. You can find that by going to jlarsoncomedy.com. Now, everybody, please welcome the host of the Throughline Podcast, the great Jay Larson. Jay, welcome to the DTFH, my friend. Woo, baby, I love it. I love you. You're so awesome, man. I did your when I did your podcast. You left. I felt happy for like a week after hanging out with you. Me too, bro. Cool. You know what's funny is I was like talking to a buddy of mine on the way here and told him I was coming with you, and I'm like, God, he's like, he's like the most peaceful creature. And then we're walking in together, and you're like, you know what fucking makes me mad? And I was like, <laughs> Duncan, you get mad? Fuck yeah, <laughs> dude. I mean, this is a good. This is like a thing that is like a danger because if you, like, yeah, you, some people don't want to admit that yeah for some reason what like, that they get mad yeah or that they're they, people want to like peaceful people they get home and they're assholes <laughs> yeah, totally. i was just reading about this it's like on stage and off stage and so yeah. like you can never believe the way someone acts on stage you gotta be a fly on the wall yeah when they're getting weird mail or bad bills or you know what i mean or, <laughs> what's or, or, weird mail you know what i was like you know some unexpected massive fucking bill or totally subpoenaed or whatever the fuck because it's like on stage anybody can act like well it's the same as like online yeah on social media yeah, yeah everyone can look beautiful but just you i always have to constantly remind myself like that's not everything no way no way no way and it's tricky and then you'll start going nuts so like anytime i can i try to admit like oh no man i get fucking pissed just to make sure that like you know you know like 
in the old days of media, this you would have static personalities in the sense you'd see like Jay Leno, and he's pretty much the same Jay Leno every night. David mm-hmm. Letterman, same David Letterman every night. A little more grumpy mm-hmm. than Leno, which was awesome. Totally. Because you'd see him go, be in a bad fucking mood, and it was cool. Like It made people excited. But then you watch Sean Hannity. I don't know if you watch Fox. I I, I hate watch Fox all yeah. day fucking long. And like, um, and I love it. Like, I, yeah. I when I say hate watch, I mean I love it. It's like inter, it's an inter, he's an entertainer. But when you see Hannity, O'Reilly, Rachel Maddow, I don't care what side of the political spectrum, you only see the same persona pretty much. True. I've seen some guys switch over. Like Don Lemon, he is just totally. You know Don Lemon? Yeah, sure. He's totally just throwing the towel and be like, I'm not a journalist anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. No. I'm on the left. Yeah. And I'm going to be, he's like, <sighs> you know, take, take a look at the clip. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, dude. It, remember, like, uh, journalists used to be in the middle. They would report the news. That's yeah. just not the case anymore. They were like robots. Yeah. And they would say in this kind of like, we, and I think that was the idea of the journalistic patter was that it yeah. was to not convey bias you were just supposed to be like but about 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 and then they started conveying bias and then the whole thing got split apart and now you don't know what the fuck you're watching because on one side it's like all representing one paradigm on the other side it's another and you're, everyone's like oh fuck it it's all just entertainment yeah no shit at this point but it was, you know anytime anybody breaks their character for the world it's usually a gift because usually i've noticed like the shit i'm embarrassed about or i'm trying to hide anytime i finally admit it that's when people be like, thanks yeah, for saying that. A hundred percent. That's when people relate to you because you're being vulnerable. And I, I saw, so I was with my buddy the other night who's an architect and I go, uh, I go, y- you probably don't go through this, but I'm like, and, and as, as a comedian, I have certain, I had like a bad day the other day. And like, you ever have those days where you just start off and things are a little off? Like even as much as like you get to an intersection and you go to wave someone on and they, and they look at you like, go ahead, dick face. And you're like, what, what, what did I do? Yeah. And then for the rest of the day, it's like that. Yeah. And I was like. I get to the, the comedy store and I had a weird interaction with two comics. And I'm like, oh, no, is this going to happen on stage? And I went to the green room and it was a weird. I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little off right now. And I was telling him about this and he goes, no. Yeah, I have those days. What do you think? It's just you? He goes, I have days and I'm like, do people see me? Am yeah. I even alive? You know, yeah. and he's an architect. And I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, we're all going through the same stuff. It's just a matter of being willing to admit it and be vulnerable so people can let themselves in and be like, oh, thank God you feel that way. Yeah, yeah. man. Um, yeah, that's like the mo- the people to not trust are the people who seem to be univer- like universally enlightened. And, and that's when you like quite – you know, people get disappointed all the fucking time. Like how often do you hear about this? But to- Tony Robbins, for example, that just came out on BuzzFeed about Tony Robbins. What? Oh, I don't like a, it was a like a, a me too thing. He was taking showers in front of people, according to BuzzFeed. Not I don't it's like, you know, he hasn't been to court yet. I don't know how much of it's real or not, but, it's yeah. you know, um, and, and so what ends up happening is like massive disappointment because people when they see Tony Robbins, when they see so, anybody like that. They hold them to this expectation of being perfect or godlike. Yeah. And, yeah. and if they if you let people do that to you. You are fucking up, man, because you yeah. can only disappoint them unless you're actually godlike. Like, if you were a god, then you have to let people know. I am, like, uh, I'm not fallible. I am, like, a perfect being of love and light, a transcendent entity channeling the cosmos. And I've, I don't, I don't, <laughs> su- you have to tell, you can't do, you can't. What I'm saying is theoretically, and I really mean theoretically, if you were yeah. to get enlightened, Jay, and you probably will. You would have to be honest about that too. Yeah, you wouldn't get to lie and be like, "No, I, I don't. I, I I get pissed off. I feel horrible sometimes." You have to be like, "I actually am happy all the time," which is the other side of it, which is weird. You ever get to that point where you're like getting like some, you're hitting a stride, you're in the fucking zone, you're hit, you're like crushing it. You've got some fucking heat, and you are maybe around friends who are not necessarily there, and you want to lie or summon up negativity to harmonize with their reality because you feel like you're a, you're a success will offend them? Yes, 100%. And I also have been on the other side of the coin. Me too. Where you're like... I can feel people pulling away from me that are doing well. Like ever have a friend who's like crushing and got something really good going on and you're trying to, you can see it. Like it took me a long time to see that though, because now we're at the point where we were talking about before 
you know, we have friends that are like, everyone's on, all of your friends at this point, when yes. you've been in the game this long, are on a show, have a show. We're yeah. trying to like, four of us are trying to figure out a golf date and everyone's got a TV show. And I'm like the only one without a TV show. And I'm like, all right, but I don't, I can, so I've been on both sides. I've felt myself being like, oh shit, like I can't talk about what's good for me right now. And then I've been on the other one where I'm like, oh man, I start bringing up like what sucks and I see them kind of like pull away or adjust and you're like, oh God, just don't bring it up, Jay. Just yeah. like, don't bring it up. Like you'll get there, you know? Well, this is to me, I remember once I was at, in New York with Ari. Ari was cr is crushing it usually. And I realized he was padding his description of what was happening to him because he recognized that he was crushing it. And at the time I was not. Yeah. And it made me feel so bad because I'm like, motherfucker. But he could sense that, like, you know, I, w I hate having to exert a magnanimous attitude towards a friend who's having success and it's hurting me. And you're like, I don't, the fact that this is hurting me yeah. shows that right now I am like in a weird spot. Yeah. And so I, what do you do in that? Do you like just back away and give them space? Cause I did it. I, this happened to me recently with a friend and they got a show and there was kind of like this promise that I was going to get, be involved. And I never asked. They yeah. came to me about it. You're going to be this. You're going to do this. And I was like, cool. And I never – and then they got picked up and then they went radio silence. And then I was like, hey, is there a thing there? And they're like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't get it. And then they wrote me this long apology that they didn't need to do. You know what I mean? I was like, yeah, I never expected anything. Yeah. And then they got – they're in. then all of a sudden their life becomes consumed with that that thing because it takes so much time as you, i'm sure you're I seeing can't, i can't talk hold on uh, uh you can't say that well i'm you mean the my uh, my uh the, the my seashells i've been collecting yeah. i'm consumed with a collection yeah, of either, seashells you know when you have something that consumes you like that yes you've seen our friends go through it and then i kind of just like so i was like before they went to go do this show i sent a, like a long email saying like yo crush this you earned this like just gave like a motivational thing and saying like congrats and then we talked once and then like we just i was like oh i'm gonna let them do their thing i know they're busy and then they reach out to me like hey you around tomorrow to like talk and i was like yeah and then like we talked and the, and we talked for like a half hour and he's like yo i just wanted to like catch up and like touch base and i was like kind of like had to like leave it on his terms to call yeah. me because I was just like, I don't know. It wasn't that I didn't know where I fit. I just kind of wanted to give him space to do what he needed to do and not feel like I was like padding in a way to think, I don't want him to think, I don't want to get in his head while he's doing what he needs to do to think that he may owe me anything. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when he reached out, as soon as he reached out, I was like, yeah, I'll call you, but, and then I called and he wasn't there. So I called three hours later. Like, I'm like, I'll stay on it to make sure the call happens. And we, yeah. it was awesome. Yeah, you know? man. Yeah. It, there's a, well, it's like, the problem is it is really hard to not be selfish. Like, you, you know, like we're stuck in a body and, and you look down and you see your body and you look in the mirror and you see your face and you, no matter how you try to get out of it, if you have a body, then you are literally at the center of your own universe. There's 100%. no way to not be like self-centered. And, and then we live in a world where like that self-centered attitude is like taught as the way to be. Yeah. How, like how, how many, like one well, out of. And ran live by it. Oh. And thinks every artist should live by it. Do you what do you, do you subscribe to that philosophy? I don't subscribe to Ayn Randism or anything like What's that. What's it but called? There's another name for it philosophically. I'm not very familiar I'm with it. I'm not sure. I just you know, I love the Fountainhead. I love that damn book. It was amazing to me. It I never like, got through it. Like I started reading oh. every time I start reading it, but it's it's some kind of like it's capitalism, right? It's like the notion of Yeah, but of like almost like self-capitalism. You know what I mean? Like you do whatever you need to do. And we see it with artists like you become your art becomes more important than anything else and no one excuse me around you is going to matter you know what i mean like you're going to be like oh yeah sorry it's my art or it's my passion for her it was like artists and people in general you should pursue whatever your ultimate goal is and i think it had something to do with her idea of like you know of karma for her like karma wasn't a thing that was uh you know 
dependent upon how you act towards other people. You just go for what you need to go for. Okay, yeah, I've heard this before. This is kind of like your desires or the thing or your dreams. It's like that's the the same thing that like makes a caterpillar turn into a butterfly. And oh, that's yeah. not a thing to be ashamed of. It's not a thing to like the worst thing you could do is subvert that impulse to please someone else. Oh, yeah. Because the universe wants butterflies. It doesn't want mushy fucking cocooned up yeah. things. It wants- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm on the fringe of all that, I think. Mm. I'm not full onto anything. I look at it like, yeah, that's 100% true. And recently I've been finding the more I just focus on my own constitution and my family and what my goals are without like stepping on people to get to those things, you know, to still be considerate, to still be mindful, to still look at situations and be like, oh, you know, be careful about that person because they're in a fragile place right now. So maybe you don't bring up X. And I'll always say to my wife, like, hey, just a heads up. When we go there today, will you do me a favor and make sure to say to so-and-so's wife because I know he told me she's been sensitive about stuff. And like, I just think I always meddle a little bit Because I think that's what love is. It's like you see something that someone's going through and you make a point like, hey, maybe it's not organic for you to ask them to uh, go to yoga together. But like, I think she could really use it just by something that she told me because I look at it. I'm like, well, I hope people do that for me. You know, like every now and then I'm like, I wish my wife would tell my friends like, hey, Jay's been going through a tough tough time. You know, maybe you, you know what I mean? And uh, it's because I think that like we all need someone to like keep an eye on us you know yeah because it's kind of like okay the whole Ayn Rand fucking like art thing or whatever the fulfillment of your own personal desires and all that stuff on one level it totally makes sense but what comes to mind to me is my new experience being a dad my new experience being a husband the living in a family and that fucking shit does not fly in that situation. If I'm starting, if I, you know what I mean? If <laughs> yeah. I'm like, in any time I've tried to exert that energy is like, L- listen, I need to like, this, this thing's got to get done. I got to go down and play on my synths. Yeah. It's so embarrassing and it hurts. It doesn't feel right. Whereas like the moment I kind of like give that up and just hold my son yeah. or try to help a little bit more than my selfish fucking ass and my habits and instincts tell me to yeah it's like instantaneous lightening up to the yeah. point where whatever thing i was trying to shit out whatever my fucking idea of like some half-baked idea of making some like pseudo radiohead synth track when i was high <laughs> on fucking ketamine or something seems like some dumb basic essentially misunderstanding of what it means to exist in the world in a happy way yeah well i think at the same time there are times when my wife will say stuff like uh hey do you want me to like take the kids tomorrow morning and then you can just like uh you know have some time to yourself and i'm just like oh yeah yeah i would love that yeah and that's not luckily when you have a really good partnership that's her being unselfish and allowing me to be selfish without me having to be like selfish at the same time i still think it's healthy to be like to ask for that time you know what i mean like hey you know what like i I need some space and i need some time like my son was a perfect example we're at this like kids fair on saturday at their school we've been there four hours that's a lot they're like running around kate and i volunteered two hours each and then we're with the kids and my son like asked me to pick them up which he never does and he's like, Daddy. And he goes, I need some alone time. And Aww. I was like, you got it, bro. I go, can we get out of here? And my wife's like, yeah. And like, you know, and there were times with my kids, I say it all the time. Like, I need some space, dude. I'm going to need some space. You got to go right over there. Just go over there and play. I need a little space. And they'll be like, okay. And they just, they. the great thing about the kids at that age is they don't take things personally. Especially if you tell them, don't take this personal. I just need some space. Dad needs to breathe. And then I wait like my 20 minutes and then I go over and grab him, hug him, kiss him, be like, what do you want to do? And then we do something. But he knows, hey, did you have fun that whole time I was taking my space? And of course they were. You're a great dad. I I appreciate that. But I try and I still have faults. Fuck yeah. I mean, you got to have faults if you're going to be a great dad. Yeah. He wants a perfect fucking dad. A perfect dad is a recipe for for disaster. Disaster. What do you get? 
Did I tell you when we did the podcast? So I don't know if I told you this, but like one time my wife is out of town. I'm with the two kids. I'm giving them. I had this plan for how the night was going to go and I had the house set up and it just kept, I just kept hitting obstacle after obstacle with the kids and like they were in wacky moods and my son just kept getting grouchy and then he cried because he was upset about like he just wanted it to go his way and I had this plan that was going to be perfect for the night and it just like, Mm. then I snapped and I yelled at him and then he cried even more and Ah. then I was like... I go, you know what? Come over here to the couch before dinner. And I go, listen, I'm sorry. I shouldn't yell at you like that. I, I had an idea and it didn't go that way. I go, but something else you need to know about dad. I go, dad runs a little hot. Every now and then <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yell or I'm going to get upset. I go, but it's not about you. I'm working at it. And he's three years old, mind you. And I'm telling him all this stuff. And I go, so you understand? I'm not mad at you. This is just something with me. And he goes, okay, dad. And now the other day, like now they know, like there are times that I like yell and they go, okay. And they do it, but they never take it personal. And I don't know if it registered or not, or if it was right or if it was wrong, but I'm just like, man, I wonder if anyone in my family had ever just accepted my dad for who he was and said to us, like, oh, your dad's just being a loon right now. Give him space. Get away from your dad. He's being a dick. You know what I mean? If we would have just, if everyone might've just reacted differently to him. Fuck yeah. I don't know, but that's how it's going in my house. If you, if my dad had said that to me at any point in my life, yeah, it would have been so empowering to our relationship. And I would have felt so much more comfortable around him. Yeah. So much more connected. That, that kind of display of vulnerability, but also mixed in with like, but I'm your dad. Yeah. And this is the way it is. You know, and, and this uh, so that you're not like going to them as a therapist or some or you're not burdening them with having to be more than a three year old. You're just saying this is the terrain we're on right now. <laughs> yeah. And you know, what? I, it, it, it gave me this flashback when I was like I had been in L.A. for like two years and I worked at the Cheesecake Factory in Brentwood and all the wow. dudes there would like play hoops at this like gym on like Tuesday mornings. And I would get heated because I'm super competitive. Like I would get heated. And so finally. I went to my buddy. I'm like, hey, man, I'm not coming anymore. And he's like, why not? I'm like, I don't like who I am when I play. I get too aggressive. And it's like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I I go, I just don't feel good. And he goes, that's what we love about you. Like, we love Ah. that you get heated like that. And it was the first time I'm like, oh, they're not asking me to change. They're like, yeah, we know that about you. It's like having a friend that's a dickhead. Do you have any friends that are like just a little bit of a douche? Yes. But you know they're a douche and they're not hiding it. And you're like, yeah, that's what we kind of love about him. Yeah. You're a douche. Yeah. Yeah. This attitude is one I'm trying to adopt more and more because my one big fault I, I, I have is this weird like trying to fix people thing. Yeah. And so and nobody wants that. Like nobody wants to be fixed. People just like to be listened to. Yeah. That's what I've like noticed and it seems to be kind of the ultimate ultimate if you're around somebody to just listen yeah and not just listen with your ears but with your eyes and listen with your whole body yeah and just listen just that uh, that seems to be and that means so that if someone's you know a douche or whatever the fuck it is if you just let them like you're saying allow the space within which they can be that it's like paradoxically suddenly their douche quality kind of like begins to dissolve because and it's them you know, it's just like sometimes people you can't have you, you can't have when you when, when you have say you're at 70 percent energy in your body. Right. And you eat a Snickers. So you go up to 120. Yeah. You're coming down to 20 now because you went up 50. Now you're going to come down 50. Yeah. You need it. There's got to be a balance in the world. There's going to be douchey people. Yeah. Why do we need to change everyone? There wouldn't be humor without douchey people. There wouldn't you know there you have to have. Negative quality. No one's going to be perfect. And the second we put that expectation for the, which is why I think like Yelp is a huge problem. Everyone being able to have an opinion is a huge problem. When we were kids, you would go to crappy restaurants. You would just do that with your family. (laughs) And you'd be like, Ma, why do we come here? And she goes, I don't know. It's close. This is where we go. And now it's like, if people don't have like the ultimate experience, they take a place down and you're like, no one can be held to this level of perfection. No. What, I mean, what are you doing? It's never going to happen. Like the whole Game of Thrones thing. Everyone was like, oh oh, what God. a terrible season. And you're like, what do you want them to do? And why are you turning on them now? Yeah. They gave you 
glorious entertainment for years, yeah. and they're like, we got to end sometime. Yeah. Sorry. Seinfeld, the last two seasons of Seinfeld, those characters were written for the characters that developed over seven years. Right. You know? So they came a little hammy, and everyone's there was, and you're just like, all right, yeah, whatever. Yeah, man. It's just it. It's just what it is. It's like the, the, um, you ever hear this, this, uh, so like, the amount of energy the brain apparently exerts to filter out shit. 17.8%. <laughs> I get so crap. Yeah. 70, maybe more than that. Sure. Because so much extraneous stuff is going down that you have to spend all this energy ignoring shit, right? And That's why I do TM. Do you do TM? Yeah. Did that happen after Twin Peaks? Yes, but it wasn't because of David Lynch. Okay, well, we'll put a pin in that and get okay, back yeah, to sure. it real quick. But yeah, it is connected to TM, and and the which is essentially the idea is that the, the so if Game of Thrones mm -hmm. is seriously upsetting you, uh -huh. that's painful. Yeah, that, that's just basic pain. So like a show that was meant to be something entertaining is hurting you, and and so it's hurting you to the point that you're going online. And you're signing petitions to get it redone and you're emailing people. Mm -hmm. And if you just sit still for a second and feel what that feels like, you'll realize like, oh my God, this is burning me. Like I'm being burnt by an expectation and that's called being caught. And, Interesting. and, and so, yeah. And so the, the idea is like from every, we all have it. It's yeah. not just Game of Thrones. It's like, uh, good God, the fucking speaking of Seinfeld, man, I can't watch Seinfeld. Why? Because of that bass lick in in it, that <laughs> boop, I, I don't know what I like. I've thought to myself, like, did something happen to me when yeah. I was a kid, where there was like a Seinfeld s bass lick happening simultaneously, so that I have some repressed memory connected to that fucking sound? Because my reaction to the Seinfeld bass does not match. A Seinfeld bass. It means like something happened to me when I was hearing a bam, but the bow. I don't know what, and I don't want to know right now what it is. But what I mean is, I don't get to enjoy Seinfeld, not because Seinfeld sucks, but because I'm stuck there. Yeah. Right. And so the more of those things you have in your life, the more pain you're going to be in, and the less of those things you have in life, the more you're going to fucking love your life. That's like, let me see. Shit, where'd it go? Oh man. Fuck, I had it right here. Hold on. What was it? It's this Zen book. Well, anyway, the, the, the it starts off with this. What's the name of it? The problem is, that's the problem. I can never remember the name of any of these <laughs> fucking Zen books. The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? You can make it, you know, River and Stream. The, 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 Dude, have you ever seen a, uh, Rivers and Tides? No. <sighs> Documentary, Rivers and Tides. I'll, tell, I'll remind you, if everyone out there, Rivers and Tides. Rivers and this, Tides. It's about this artist who goes out into the wilderness, and this is what his art is. He takes he takes things in, in the world and then just turns them into art, and some of them only last. Like, at one point, he goes to this river, and he collects – he goes around and forages for this red clay that's, like, buried in the river. Yeah. And then he collects it all, turns into a big ball, right? Yeah. And goes to the top of the river and drops it in. And when it lands, the water just goes and turns like metallic red Whoa. from the clay. And it lasts, I don't know, 20 seconds and then it's done. Wow. But he does other things like builds these structures and like he's just – he's fucking rad. So he's like working with impermanence. He's like – that's his medium. Is I don't like know, but I, in... that's the name of my new, uh, my new autobiography, Working with Impermanence. Yeah, man. <laughs> working with in fucking permanence. Well, this is the um, – uh, is the medium, I guess, that we're dealing with. And this is why our brains get so fucked up when a friend is like having some success or when we're having some success and a friend isn't is because we can so easily forget this is not a permanent experience. It's like when you run into someone and it's very rare, whenever I run into it, man, I kind of enjoy it. But when you run into someone experiencing a little temporary success mm -hmm. who's managed to get a big fucking head and you realize they're like acting. I, I, I rarely see this. It's a stereotype. Yeah. The person who's got some fame and turns into a deep, hard-baked, 
fuckhead, right? Yeah, you know what? I haven't seen that really that much either. I've seen it. I was a talent coordinator at the comedy store. I saw I remember. it once during the entire time. Yeah. And it was shocking to the point of being like, I wanted to be around it because it's like, wow, it's a real dick. Like Damn. someone whose fame has actually gone to their head. They're actually alienating people, imagining that this is going to last. And it's like, man, it doesn't, it, it can't last. Similarly, you run into people in the opposite situation mm -hmm. where there is a little drought happening. And it is going to their fucking head because they think this is going to last. And so now they're also acting in an imbalanced way, completely out of fear, yeah. not realizing like, oh, no, man, you'll get some success. Don't worry. It's going to come. It'll happen. And then that's going to go away, too. And so this is the nature of the beast, so to speak. And the more I get caught on either side of that fucking spectrum, the more I'm not able to paradoxically to do the activities or to do the creative output it yeah. would make anything worthwhile yeah because my brain is trying to hold on to one spot right yeah well you know what when you said earlier I, I when i was saying you i had that that day where everything seemed a little off i it had been like two months since i since i had like had an off day you know what i mean for like two months i had been like good moods everything was going well even though i wasn't like work things weren't popping or whatever i was content within my world you know what i mean family wife everything i was content and then i had this day and i'm like oh i haven't felt one of these days in a minute whereas there have been other times where you know you go months with like horrible days and you're like what the fuck man how do i get out of this and then you get out for two days and then you'll come back to it and so yeah you have to find it's for me when i find the balance within myself and i'm just focused on what i can do within myself you know what I mean? That's all. That's when everything seems to like straighten out. Fuck yeah. Yeah. And that is finding that spot is the, um, that it's always there. It's like, you know, like, you know, so for me, I'm anxious. I get anxiety and I can distract myself from the anxiety and even imagine the anxiety is not there, but it's still there. It's an undercurrent. And what, what, what gives it to you? Do you know? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you on the next time I do your podcast. Yeah. Only because it's too much. It, it would go on and on. Yeah, and on. yeah. I, but but uh, one of my teachers, Ramdas, says it, it's these levels are happening all at once. Yeah. So on one level, you are maybe absolutely terrified mm -hmm. about losing everything. For me, you know, like – the paradox of having a a, a a baby is like, you know, we put him down and he stops crying and he goes to sleep. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, my God, is he OK? Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? And it's under there. It's under there. And you have to sort of like divert your attention from that level to the next level, which is like actually he's sleeping peacefully. And if I go in to check on him neurotically, it's going to create cr tears. Dude. One of the first things ever when I was having a kid. So, like, you know, pe family members send you, like, gifts and stuff like that. You know, cribs, changing table, all that kind of shit. Well, my my mother-in-law's friend sent us this mat you put under the mattress. And if the baby doesn't roll over or move every 20 minutes, it beeps. And it, like, prevents SIDS, right? Whoa. So, we're like... uh we're, we're getting the room ready and I'm putting this thing in and I'm sitting there with my wife and I go, what are we doing? And she's like, what do you mean? I go, are we really going to live in a world where we need something to help us feel safer about the fact that we're not going to lose the thing that we love? I'm like, mm -hmm. get this thing the fuck out of here. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't want that. Why are we ever going to, why don't we just get a rubber car? You know what I mean? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. Life is going to happen and, and let's live it freely Whoa. and let things, ha whatever happens to us happens and we'll deal with it. But I would rather live freely than, and she was like, 100%. I mean, she doesn't always agree. Like, sometimes I'll leave the house unlocked at night and she'll be like, you know, you left the house unlocked last night. Fuck. And I'm I like, that. I go, yeah. And she goes, that doesn't concern you. And I'm like, we're still here. They didn't get us last night. We'll lock it tonight in case they come by. But we're good. <laughs> Dude, I will realize I haven't locked up the house. I will be laying there yeah. thinking like about forensic files. <laughs> yeah. Knowing the alarm isn't set. The house is unlocked. Yeah. And then I'll just drift off to sleep thinking like, well, I hope we don't get strangled. Just roll the dice tonight. I hope I don't wake up tied up. Yeah. Like that, the, the, uh, 
what the Golden State Killer, you know, that motherfucker would tie up the husband and like put plates on his head so that if he moved and the plates dropped and while he was like raping the wife, you know, Jesus, Duncan, mm. that's neither here nor there. I'm sorry yeah. to bring it up, but the, it's definitely set your security. So I got to get a better chair. Every time I move, it sounds like I'm farting. Um, So this to me is is like one of the amazing things about you is that you have the most simultaneously edgy personality and this like amazing wild co co comedian, true comedian self that seems really well balanced with being a dad. And a lot of times comedians are not so, how would you say, family oriented. Sure. Some are. But you seem to have really, in some way or another, like, you just seem to have a natural talent for being a father. And I can't think of anything better than that to be on the planet. Like, if I had to pick between being the funniest person that ever walked the face of the earth mm -hmm. and being a good dad, I've become so fucked up that I would rather be a good dad. <laughs> And that's a mess, isn't it? No, I think that's exactly what you want to be. You know what I mean? I, I would always want to be a good dad. Instead, you're saying it's fucked up for you to want to be a better dad, dad than, a, than comedian. a comedian. But you, no, but that's a, that's the selfish thing you've been talking about, like letting go of. Because if you want to be the best comedian of all time, you're going to be selfish. If you're going to be, even if you're going to be remotely successful, you're going to be selfish. If you look at all the top comedians right now. Do you think Kevin Hart – I'm not saying Kevin Hart can't be the best dad. I'm not saying that. But how much is he doing? So how much are you home? You know what I mean? Now, I, granted, we have FaceTime. He's clearly providing financially. But at the same time, you're just like, well, how much are you able to help your kids with a tiny problem that will help them deal with giant problems down the road? Right. You know what I mean? So for me, I put it this way. The other day, my son, we did a trip to Boston together three weeks ago, just me and him, first time ever. And he never takes showers. He still takes baths. And I'm like, I, we kept saying, like, hey, when you turn five, you're going to take showers? He's like, yeah, daddy. And he, <laughs> and he never did. So we went on this trip. I'm like, you know what we're going to do on this trip? And he goes, well, I go, showers, bro. And he's like, okay, dad. And Whoa. now he's taking a shower every day since. Whoa. He loves them. So the other day, we were home, and my wife was with my daughter. And I was like, hey, bud, you want to grab a quick shower? And he's like, yeah. So we hop in there and I'm sitting there and he's like, I'm standing out of the water with half the water getting on him and half on me. And he's like, get, you know, there's toys down there. He's standing there just playing, talking. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, not only have I never, did I ever take a shower with my dad? I never learned how to shower from my dad. I never learned how to shave from my dad. And I never, that I can remember because he left when I was two, slept under a roof in the same house with my dad. Whoa. My son in the morning will get up, come in the bed at like 7.15 and be like, hey, dad. And I'm like, hey, big boy. Sometimes we'll just chill. You know, my wife's there. Sometimes he goes to my wife. Like, whatever. They wake us up, which is the greatest thing in the world. That never happened ever in my life. Wow. And I was just sitting there taking a shower with him and being like, God, how amazing is this? Like, I'm so... I love that we get to... I taught him how to shower and now we're just chilling in here and he gets to like the idea of being comfortable around his dad with his family. I mean, we're not going to take showers together forever, no. you know. And uh, I took a shower with my dad in, until he passed. We were, took showers every day that I was with him. Are you for real? No. <laughs> <laughs> was fucked up thing ever. It was really fucked up to fuck with me like that. I'm <laughs> like, Jesus, Duncan, how old were you when your dad passed? <laughs> um, you know what I mean? But like, I, so for me, when you say that, I I have this new philosophy that. Um, at least for this like idea that I'm working on, that uh, parenting skips a generation. Whoa. You know what I mean? Because like I'm sitting there looking at it, and I'm like, oh, I didn't have anyone to parent me. My dad didn't parent me. My mom's a single mom of four. She's doing her best, and now I'm coming in, and I'm looking at my kids. And now, granted, my wife came from a super solid background. Her parents are still yeah. together. They, they, and I'm not saying parents need to stay together. They, they just still need to be parents right. and be communicative. And I'm not saying my mom was an amazing woman and parent in a lot of things. But I, I've, I think I said this when we were chatting on my podcast. Uh, 
is like my mom never said, hey, today's your dad's birthday. You need to give him a call, you know, and that would be her being unselfish. That would be her no matter how bad she hated him. That should be an element of parenting and being a mother is saying you need to have a father in your life. Right. You need to call your father. You, yeah. that, you need that to be. That was never a case in my house. It was, I don't know my dad's birthday. Whoa. You know, I don't know. His, I never knew his birthday. I never knew their wedding anniversary. I never knew any of that. You know, like it just wasn't something that like ever came up. That means my dad was having birthdays by himself somewhere with his wife or whoever, whatever he was doing. And we were off living our life, not a part of his day. And that to me, if you look, first of all, I'm a firm believer that every single one of us is connected through somewhere else. I ever tell you this vision I've had? I had this vision one time. I had this vision of this big giant orb, right? In space. Yeah. With all spinning balls around it. Yeah. You know, almost looking like an atom. And then I just had this ima- this thing came to me that when we're born or become, you know, a human, one of those balls goes and shoots down inside one of us, becomes our soul. Whoa. We live. When we die, it goes back to the ball and feeds back into this one universal thing. Shit. So almost like we're all a part of each other because we're living. And it's so I always think of it as like you're just here to hopefully – Try to be your best. You're going to make mistakes and have faults, but you just, whatever that knowledge is that you're going to gain positive, negative feelings, successes, failures, you're going to take back and put into the, the greater good again. You know what I mean? Of the one thing that we all exist from, you know? Whoa, man. That is so beautiful. So I have a constant, like, um, like when I see my kids, I don't just. I don't just see them as my children. I see them as humans. And I'm like, well, the first responsibility I have is to put a good human in the world, which means you're going to carry your lunch into school because you need to learn responsibility and you need to take ownership and you need to feel pride and you need to be someone who uses a turn signal when you're switching lanes. Right. So carry your lunch. I'm not carrying it for you. And I don't do it in a mean way, but I'm like, you carry your lunch to school. That's part of going to school. And for me, it's like, you know, uh, when I tell you no, it's because I know this is for your good down the road. You might get mad at me right now and be upset at me. I don't care. You know I love you. Like, if I'm like, if, if I'm with the two kids and one needs a little more attention than the other one, I give it. But then I always make sure to go over and give a little, like, pinch or a little kiss and be like, who's my big boy? And then go on. Because... And, I mean, that's just me being sensitive to the idea that I don't want either of them to feel left out. Also knowing that there are times when one needs a little more and it's okay that I give them more. You know what I mean? So it's, again, what we talked about earlier about, like, hey, are you just looking out for people without sacrificing your own self? I'm not sacrificing my my need to be a dad to one child against the other one. And at the same time, it's no skin off my back or energy taken away to go over and make sure the other one knows, like, yo – I just talked to them and did this thing that they need to do and told you to wait a second. But now I'm giving you a little little bump on the butt to say, hey, I'm here too, you know? Wow. I want to – so this is what's really fascinating about you. Many things are fascinating about you. But so here you have on one side this like – I don't even – a savant or something when it comes to parenting. And, you, in the, and you're blowing my mind for a few different reasons because you're kind of saying things that – So like my meditation teacher has said to me, literally it skips a generation, except he was talking about like, um, uh, sometimes like in, in anyway, the transmission of some like Buddhist ideas sometimes actually skips generations Uh anyway. And then the other thing that Ramdas says, uh, is he, you know, I was asking him like, what's the best, you know, how to be a great dad. What's the best way to be a great dad for Forrest, my son? And he goes, first of all, such a great name. Oh, thanks, man. He goes, first of all, not he, he's a soul. Yeah. Not your son, soul first. Yeah. And then your son. So soul over role, as they say, soul over role. So the idea is like, first, you're the spinning, beautiful, sort of very t- temporary manifestation of the whole that's taken a birth in a human incarnation but from from your own free will, you decided to take the birth. You wanted to come and swim around in this particular part of the resort of the universe, so to speak. And you picked your parents and you picked these experiences. Is and that it, real? 
well, that, is it real? But is, this, that's what Ram Dass says? Yeah. Because you know, that's, God. I, that was another thing I used to always think when I was really young. Not really young. Maybe it was like when I got into my 20s where I was like, I think before you're born, you pick the life you want to have because you want that challenge. So like people that get like Tiffany Haddish, for example, you take Tiffany Haddish and she's she's had a she's had a tough road to get to where she is as a person. And you're like, yeah, but only her could have got through that. Right. You know what I mean? And uh, I used to always think that I'm like, oh, I think I picked these things, you know, even though all I maybe I picked having a dad that was gone because all I ever want to do is be built into someone that could be a dad. You know, even though I, tr- I was like, I would, I, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes like I do, I'm working on a bit right now where I'm like, man, I love being a dad. It's my favorite thing in the world. But when I see people without kids, I'm like, oh, what a good life. <laughs> yeah. just, where are you going to Italy? Where are you going? <laughs> are you doing anything? With you? Get away. You can go wherever you want, you know? Um, so I definitely, that's refreshing to hear that, you know, the idea that you picked it and you. You know, embrace it. You need that fucking clay to drop in the river, man. Like yeah. that is, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. the concept. Is and, and if you forget that, things can seem really fucked up because you start feeling like, you know, when you find yourself in a pickle, you're like, and you and and you lose track and you don't realize. Like, listen, you have been human incarnation is like in the Shao in the like uh, kung fu movies when you get welcomed into the temple mm-hmm. and then you get your fucking ass kicked, like having to do those weird Shaolin exercises or whatever, yeah. like pouring water while you're like standing on spikes while you're about all that shit. That's what human incarnation is considered. It's like, you've been allowed into this very advanced training place, which is our lives. And you're given these opportunities to basically begin to sand yourself down and, and, and become something really beautiful and wonderful. See, this is where I was this. So this ties back into what we were saying way earlier, and I want to get this out. Another problem with this business or anyone who's chasing a dream or a goal is you came here to L.A. with an idea of what you wanted. And so then you pursue it and you pursue it and you pursue it. And either it happens or it doesn't. And either you stay in the game or you don't. But if you stay in the game, then you start to be like, was I wrong? Did I pick the wrong? Did I, I said I was coming here to do this and I haven't done it yet. So am I wrong or am I not good enough? Or did I pick the wrong thing? Am I just, is, am I clouded? Am I supposed to be a chef, but I picked this cause I don't know. Or, you know, I have tons of friends that came to be actors and then they, now they produce reality television. You know what I mean? Like, what is it? And so that's another thing that can get in the way is you're just constantly like, well, if I'm going to abide by, because we live on a spiritual level, you know, not everyone does, by the way, we live on a spiritual level. So if we believe that we picked our life and then we're living the life that we're living and it's not going the way that we always thought it was going, then you start questioning, like, am I not, am I wrong? Was I wrong in this choice? I'm 17 years into this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's something I battle a lot because especially when you're seeing your other friends like move forward, you're like, yeah, what is that? They want to, I wanted to do this too. What, why is it? You know what I mean? And then you're just like, you know, you question it. So like knowing that, like maybe you picked the life that you wanted to lead and you picked where you wanted to be. And then you start seeing what's happening around you and you see the things that are out of your control because you try and control. And then this is where I've been lately is I'm letting go of the control and just trying to like be like, all right, I'm just trying to find contentment in my life. And then thinking once I do that, the things that are supposed to happen will come to me. And that's what I've been telling the universe. Like, I'm just going to go and work my, as hard as I can. Like we were saying off mic earlier, you, at some point you just can only work as hard as you can. And then I'm just hoping that the universe is going to then reveal itself to me instead of me constantly mm-hmm. trying to be like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Why yeah. isn't this work? You know, Jay, first of all, I like, I get, so when I came, when I started working at the comedy store, I remember talking to one of the Sklar brothers. Yeah. Cause they were on TV a bunch and, I said to them, what's it like to have made it? And he laughed. I can't remember which Sklar I was talking to, but he laughed in the best way. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm yeah. like, you made it. He's like, what do you know? Like no. we're doing. And, 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 and then the other day I was talking to somebody who is so successful and they were expressing to me how insecure they feel all the time. And then you are, 
you got to be one of the best storytellers out there, man. And like, I, I, you've been, you were on fucking Twin Peaks. You have like these incredible special. You're brilliant, and you have Thanks, a. Man. You, but 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 you because you're in your body, and you are using a different sure. relative gauge, I guess, to measure where you're at. You've always been to me. You're like fuck. Larson's like killing it. I've never two things. One. If I stopped right now and never did stand up or acting or anything else again, people would look at him and be like, "Wow, he had he had a really good career." Yeah. Because you got to look at it like that. You're like, look at all the things you've done. If you look comparatively all the time, like if I compare myself to like younger comics, they would kill to have what I have. But then I look at friends, and I want I would kill to have what they have. And then if you really get down to it, it's like. What do you ultimately want? And if you ultimately want happiness and you decide that to let go of all this shit we've been pursuing and just trusting that whatever decision you make will be the right decision because you're you're making a decision or you're trusting your gut or you're following a path and it's going to open itself up to you. Like if I decided to quit today and open the bodega that I've always wanted to open, I bet I could have an amazing life, but I'm just trusting in the idea that I haven't yet and that's because I'm... I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Dude, I was reading your um, story about, and you're a great writer. So I'm reading your story about working with David Lynch, which for a lot of people would be like the apex of their life. Just yeah. a chance to get to work with him or be around him or whatever would be like, like, then your story on your website is so fucking cool and so well written. But I got really excited when you were uh, talking about how you love the beat poets. Yeah. And um, you know why they were called the beats? No. Well, now this could be wrong, but what I read is I used to think it was because, like, you know, like a beat. Yeah, yeah. And I think Kerouac in one of his poems kind of says, alludes to that. But then I heard another interpretation, which is they were beat. They were beat. Oh, yeah. Meaning they lost. They just decided, yeah, we've been beat. We're the beat generation. We've been beaten down. We've lost. We've yeah. given up. We've completely given up because we, 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 okay, we, we, uh, we lost. Like I, Maria Bamford's got a great joke, which is when people ask, like, so what are you up to? I'm sorry, anyone listening is a fan of this joke. I fuck every joke up by parrot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but her joke is so along the lines of where people are like, so what are you up to these days? And she's like, oh, I stopped. <laughs> That's tight. <laughs> yeah, man. And that, that attitude to me is so crucial to, for me to be happy, which is that the moment I put it down, the role, so to speak, or the story that I told myself years and years and years ago about, oh, how here, this is how it's going to be. Or when I realized like I'm comparing my career to like Rogan's career. Yeah. Just why don't I just get pay someone to crucify me? Yeah. <laughs> why don't I just pay someone to like get some, fu just like hang, hang me on a fucking crucifix. Yeah. Are you going to compare yourself to someone who's existing in the top one percentile of a particular industry yeah. and not expect to be like suffering? It's it, so this to me, it's like the moment I, I don't, and it's not like I give up. It's not like I'm like, oh, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm going to go find some other way or, or any of that shit. The moment I'm just like, well, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. There's just this right now. And I know I like to make stuff. And then it, the, the more I connect with that, yeah. that's where it seems to start happening. But anytime I'm doing the, the game of either yeah. like looking back to a me when I was like just out of college or. Or, or me like 10 years ago and try to like be the thing that would please that person 10 years ago. I'm literally trying to please a, a person 10 years younger than me that did, that had a mom, that had a dad, that didn't get cancer, that didn't have a baby. That, and, and then anytime I do that shit, I look at my, now I'm so lucky because I have this beautiful kid and I look at him yeah, and I'm like, this makes it all make sense. If I fucking had a time machine, I wouldn't use it, man, for fear that I would mess something up and that little boy wouldn't be on the planet anymore. Sure. You know what I yeah. mean? So what I'm saying is um, these games we play with ourselves, they're self-torture. Yeah. I rewrote my story. My whole life was defined by the fact that my dad bounced every single thing. I would walk mm. around the world as if he was always watching, like if he was behind, like I used Whoa. to, I remember walking across campus in college. I was on the right side of the quad. It was winter time. Yeah. And I was like, he came up here. He knows you're here. And he's, he wants to, he, uh. he can't talk to you, but he's watching. And I would walk with this, like 
confidence and bravado that he was watching. Every time I would play baseball, every time I would do stand up, I'm like, he's going to. Even to the day when he died and I went through his apartment, like I went back home and I went through his apartment and I looked around his apartment looking for things about me. Uh, you know what I mean? That's all I was looking for. But it defined me. So much of my stand up, there were jokes about, you know, my dad and stuff like that. And then I realized I'm like, he, you don't know what his path was. You don't know why he wasn't around or what got in the way or, and like, you know, I found all these different things. Anyway, the other day I said to my, my son, I was like, he said something about his papa. That's his, my father-in-law. And I go, yeah, your papa, your grandpa. And he goes, who's my grandpa? And I go, well, you know, my dad. And he goes, Norman. And my, my dad's name was Norman. And all his friends called him Normie. And I decided like two years ago that he was going to be Normie to my kids. You know, I'm like, yeah, your grandpa Normie. And he's like, <laughs> my daughter, who's hardcore, three years old. She goes, yeah, he's dead. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, he's not here. Shit. But they're going to know him as in that same thing that I talked about earlier, how like I wish my mom had like made us call him birthdays or whatever. They're going to know him that, yeah, he was your grandpa Normie and he was an antique dealer. He played trumpet. He only listened to classical music. He was an artist that welded and he loved to be outside. He loved to work with granite and cast iron and he was very creative and he was big and he had big blue eyes and he was he was mystical and he was he was into like wisdom and and i'm going to tell them all the positive stuff and then when they get older when they have questions i'm like yeah you know i don't know what it was about my dad but he wasn't around you know what i mean and which is why i you know and then just i'll tell them everything else but they're definitely that's their i'm not going to leave him out of their story you know what i mean like yeah, hey i'm going to fill you in on what i know about him and like they have stuff in their room that he gave to me and i'm like yeah your your grandpa normie gave us that you know what i mean because i'm like Time for me to rewrite it. Instead of being the dude who was abandoned, how about being the guy that had this – so much of me. When when I got in touch with him when I was like 25, we started emailing. And I remember reading his emails being like, holy shit, this is how I write. I write just like him. Whoa. Like he would – I remember he was like, oh, it's a snowy day today in Hamilton. Or no, I forget. Uh, this town next to Essex. He's like a snowy day. I'm up in the – you know, you know, I live in an 18th century uh, old house and I'm in the attic. It's cold up here. There's no heat. When I look outside, all I see is snow. And I'm going to trudge down to the Richdale and drop two antiques in the mail and then come back for the day. And I was like, Jesus Christ, this is how I like think. This is how I write. Mm. And I was like, that's when I – it's like I finally got a chance to identify a part of myself that I didn't know where to place. So like right. when I take showers with my son – or I teach my daughter how to use a drill or all the things that I wish I, that the things I taught myself, taught myself how to shave. I remember being in college freshman year and I was shaving. Right. And I, uh, I would shave and then shower. Right. And there was this kid, Eddie Hannon, who was like a fifth year senior transfer. It was like big hockey dude. Awesome kid from Maine. And he's like, what are you doing? And what do you mean? He goes, what, what do you, you, sh you shave and then you shower. I go, yeah. He goes, no, you shave, you shower. The hot water and air gets in your skin, makes it easier to shave. You shave after. And I was like, oh, all right. And I had never known. I just never knew. And I'm like, all these little things I'm going to get to teach my kids, which is, again, not only does parenting skip a generation, but all the – it took me – so it took me till 20 or 18 years old to learn how to shave. He'll learn how to shave at, I don't know, 12. You know what I mean? So – that's our, he's already got a six year head start on me with that. I'm going to teach him how to use money. I'm going to teach my daughter how to use money. I'm going to teach them how to like drill, saw, build, uh, how to be respectful. I've already been teaching them how to shake hands at this young age. I'm going to teach them how you look in an eye. I'm going to, dude, I took my daughter on Saturday to the self realization, um, mm -hmm. you know, that place in the yeah, Palisades. Sure. And I said to her, I'm like, hey, this is a place where people come and meditate because they know I meditate. And then, some of Reed's teachers meditate and sometimes I find him in the backyard with his legs crossed and him just sitting and his eyes oh, closed. Shit. I mean, he'll do it for like six seconds, but he's like, That's I'm great. meditating. And like meditation is going to be a part of their life. They're going to know it. And when they get old enough, then I will get them into it where they can like take a class and learn TM or whatever form that they want to learn. But so we're walking around that self-realization. I was like, Hey, that there, you know, we gotta, you have to be quiet when you hear. There's not like yelling and screaming. And my daughter who's three, we were there for an hour the whole time. Talk like this, Daddy. Daddy, come over here. 
and whispered the whole time. And there's a, ch- there's a chapel there, you know? And we went in. I go, do you want, I go, we can't go in. I held her. I'm like, look in. And she goes, can we go in and say a prayer? And I go, yeah. And we went in, sat down. I was like, she sat, I sat, she's got her hands like together and like wow. did her own little prayer. And she's like, let's go. And I'm like, hold on. I'm, I'm in the middle of mine. <laughs> Give me two seconds. <laughs> and it was like amazing. And I'm like, oh, the more, the more before you have kids, you challenge yourself to learn, the more you can offer and feed into that next generation so that they know more, they're more awake. You know what I mean? they have more knowledge. They have knowledge of like, I want my kids to have a knowledge of money. Cause it's something I never had. Like how to save. Yeah. You make a dollar, you put at least 25 cents away. That's right. just start getting used to that. Yeah. You know, so that they can like be financially set. It's like, it's like that guy who just, who did the, um, the graduation address at Morehouse College. Did you see that guy? No. You know what he did? Oh, he paid off everyone's everyone's student loan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. he said to the alumni, and he goes, and all the alumni here today he goes, this is my class. 2019 is my class. Wow. I'm going to pay for all them. Basically saying to the alumni, get off your ass. Wow. And someone else sponsored the next year. And like, if they can start, especially, in the, you know, I'm white, but in the black community, I've always had this, like, I always had a passion for Judaism and I always had a passion for Native Americans and African Americans because I loved, I always felt as a kid who had nobody and felt like, like as waste and discard and having a dad that didn't love me, I felt Like only felt connection to like Native Americans being ripped away from their place, being African-Americans just like being beat down in, you know, not being able to vote. Like Martin Luther King was an idol of mine. O.J. Simpson, Um, (laughs) you know, Hank Aaron. These were all my idols. They were all black men. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, that he's like supporting the young black men in America and giving them a head start. And as a dad, I'm gonna, I, I say to my wife, I'm like, the only reason I want money is to be able to give them a head start, not so that when they turn 25, I can be like, here's $200,000, but so I can say, yeah, you don't have to pay for college. Right. Or you know what? You do have to pay for it. You give it to me. And then I take that money and I put it in a savings account. And then when they're 25 and they're like moving to a city, we say, hey, how about we go to that city and you buy a condo? And you can start having an investment so that there's money in your wow. life and you can start, you know, building something that's going to help you succeed so that you're not 43 like me, don't own a house and have student loan debt. Yes, you know what man. I mean? man. This, you are the answer, man. You know, I'm making you my father guru. <laughs> no, I am. Like, I don't have it. Like, every, like, it's so funny. Everything you're saying, I'm just like soaking it in because it's so like, it's so on the level. It's so good. And I like... We, so many people went through the divorce boom, man. Like so many people are children of divorce. They didn't have a father figure. Maybe they didn't have a mother figure and they're, they have no idea how to do, do it. They Mm -hmm. have no idea how to be in a relationship that lasts. They have no idea how to be married. They certainly have no idea how to like be a good father. They're self-absorbed, self-obsessed. And, and within that, there's so much room just to continue this never ending shit snowball that's been rolling through time. Yeah. And the moment someone like you like grabs the energy that very easily you could be bitter very easily. You could just bitter. Yeah. Oh, well I have been forever. Yeah. And I constantly work on it and I still get it. But I just like, you know, it's the same thing we're talking about. I wouldn't sit here and talk about my bitterness, but I do get it. And I, I work at it of years, dude. I went to therapy, still do for years because I'm like, oh, I constantly need to work. Otherwise, you just fall into old ruts and old habits. And when I have bad days, I just have to be like, all right, man, you got to work at this. You have to like, you know, do something to motivate. Like, and I've also learned lately to give myself breaks. Yesterday afternoon, I was like, take a break, dude. Like. It's not happening today. Yeah. Go go lay in the hammock for an hour. That's what I want to know, man, is how are you like how are you balancing your your stand up, your writing, the fucking hard work you're putting into your projects and how do you balance that with being a dad? How are you making these two things coincide and also how are you staying funny? You know that myth or like a lot of people say once you have kids you're not funny anymore? It eats me alive, man. I haven't been on stage in six months. I'm terrified yeah. to get back on stage. 
Because what, what if it's all gone? Like, what if I can't be funny anymore? Yeah, well, you will be. You're a funny person in general, so it's not going to matter. I, I, first of all, I don't know. The way I balanced it was I just said uh, the kids are more important, mm. you know? And I was like, dude, trust me. <laughs> you know, as a stand-up, you got to be on the road. And I always said, like, I just don't want to be on the road because I knew I was going to want to be home with my kids. And now I'm looking at, like, guys. Like, you look at Segura. Remember how much road Segura did way before he had kids? Yes. He was always on the road. Yeah. I remember thinking, like, what's he doing? Like, don't you want to get on a TV show or something like that? And it's like, oh, no. Tom did all that work on the road, built a fan base, built an act, built the ability to write stand-up continuously. So then now all that stuff just came to him because he worked on that one thing. Yes. And that was just never the route I took. And I always look at it, and not in an envious way, but I'm like, ah, man, I wish I kind of had done that. But it's okay. I picked this road. So I feel like the balance hasn't been... First of all, if you're able to conceptualize the idea that balance doesn't have to be 50-50, it could be 70-30, huh. then it becomes, you know, if your balance is just putting 100% into your life, whether that be 70% here and 30% there, but 100% into that 30, into the 70, then you're going to be balanced. Wow, cool. So, like, I could be doing way more work in stand-up and being getting up. I could be getting up every night if I wanted to, but then I have to pay for a sitter because my wife is out of town. And I just started looking at it like... This is all you can do because, like, my wife is out of town last night and tonight, right? But I have to get out tonight. I have to. So I got to sit her for tonight. But there's no way I want my kids to go two nights in a row without me being there. Last night, we did, um, we hung out at my neighbor's for a while after we ate dinner at a table by ourselves, listening to music because that's what we do. Went over and played at my neighbor's. Then we came over, played out back. Everybody had to get in their PJs. Then we, sat and read six books. We like read six books and then we go into the room and then hang out. What do you mean you read six books? We read six books. I picked two that each, each one of them picked two. I mean, but the kids like these books five minutes each or something, right? Yeah. Something like, like that. Okay, but I mean, we read books for like 40 minutes. Sometimes we do eight. Sometimes it's two, but a lot of, t it, on average, it's at least four. I like to just like, for me, it like winds them down. And my friends were like, they're like, you know, God, that, you know, Finally, we got the kids where you can just put them in their room and say goodnight. And I'm like, yeah, I, I just kind of like having 40 minutes. I always block off 7 to 8 o'clock is going to be the time for like starting to like do the bedtime thing. Because for me, I like it. Like I like we brush our teeth together. We we go in there. We'll clean up together. We might go for a walk around the neighborhood as part of that. Then come home and read. Some nights they watch TV. Some nights it's like, okay, you get TV tonight. And they'll watch TV. And then they, you know, they go to bed. But – um. I just don't like to do it as far as the balancing thing is uh, I've, I've just put I feel like I've put part of my career on the back burner to focus on them. And part of that is that my wife, her job calls her to travel as well. So I can't I don't want a life where before kids it used to be she would go away. We went through a stretch one time. She went away on a Monday, came back on Thursday. I left Thursday to do clubs Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I came home Sunday. She left on Monday. I left on Thursday and we went like a month and we had been in the house together like three times. And I just kind of looked at him like my wife is in sales. You can't just leave sales and get another job at the same amount of money you make. So it was like family is number one. And right now she makes more money keeping that job than she would as if she left that job and we focused on mine. You yeah. know what I mean? So I was like, Hey, I'll keep hitting singles and swinging for home runs and you keep the doubles up and eventually like you said it's going to settle into my spot you know this is your spot yeah well this is like yeah for sure but i still am hoping that we hit something where like i'm able to take my comedy and my love for parenting and being a dad and put that into a show that's and then yeah. and where the show comes into our you world have to. yeah that's what i mean that's what we're trying you, you know? got to man because it's we don't like it's so cool. Yeah, I don't know what it's going to be that you that like the it's it's like really cool listening to this part of the like the matter as it's beginning to like form into something and and I don't know what your uh, the details of what you're working on but holy shit. You know, as someone who's a fan of the Beat Poets, yeah. Uh, Kerouac, 
Ginsburg, you know, Shogun Trumpa Rinpoche, my teacher's teacher was Allen Ginsburg's teacher. Oh, wow. And he was this great Buddhist teacher, real, uh, real controversial figure. But you know how they met? Arguing over a fucking cab. Like Ginsburg <laughs> got in the cab and Trumpa Rinpoche got in the cab at the same time. And they like for a second were like arguing over who and then they shared the cab. And then um, it, it's the craziest coincidence because this is like a – in Tibetan Buddhism, which is known uh, is known as a tulku or a reincarnation, the Dalai Lama is one. So it's one where they go to the child and they show all this stuff to the child, and the child like picks the items that he had in the previous oh, incarnation. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and to you pick, would, uh, to, to pick the Dalai Lama, right? Well, yeah, and they do it for other the other tulkus as well, oh, like okay. other. But uh, as a side note, if you want to add to your list of. Um, uh, people to connect to that have been uh, that are refugees, the Tibetans, man, they got fucking kicked out of their homeland by the Chinese. And they like, it's a really beautiful story, man. But anyway, um, <clears throat> Trump Rinpoche, uh, his ad advice for how to like create what he called an enlightened society mm -hmm. is to create a sacred home environment. And that is what you're doing. In the I just heard this recently. Someone else. I, and politically, my whole thing has always been like, why are we not just taking care of Main Street? We spend six trillion dollars a year on wars. If we put that money into here, like, why are we not doing that? And then again, if you build that home, then you build the kids. Well, you know, yeah. Of, of, please yeah. continue. Sorry. Well, that's it. That yeah. you just said it. I mean, that like all these plans and all the stuff that we all want. Everyone wants a world to be a beautiful, harmonious world. Yeah. But in the moment you decide, okay, I'm going to fucking, you know, I'm going to try to become a famous this or a famous that. I'm going to exert my ego into the world and try to get this very temporary success at the cost of abandoning my children abandoning my wife what ends up happening is okay great you made a, a million dollars and you've got some great comedy albums but you had three children who are severely neurotic because they were overshadowed by you and they had a feeling that they were unwelcome visitors into their own home because they were getting in the way of your art and then now those three kids are going to have kids and now we have this never-ending sort of uh, fragmentation in society that's happening. Whereas the moment someone like you gets lucky enough and smart enough to like pull it together and to like focus on the actual like fundamental, the heart of society is the family. Then people like me who are just like, well, I'm in awe, man. Like I did not do this. Like I, I am. I mean, I'm li like I'm soaking it in. And then, then that. Yeah, gets... but we, it, you know, we all have a different path. We all are going to be learning at different stages and different times, you know. And at the same time, I also look at some people that might not be uh, as present at home with their family. It doesn't mean they're not a good parent. And ultimately, at the end of the day, like they might be doing stuff for the greater good of the world by. You know, being able to, you know, do their art, you know, I have no idea. I just know for me, this right. was like, even though I fight with it, like, man, I, I wish I was working more. I wish I could be doing more, you know, and then, you know what, that happens during the day. And then like 445 when I'm going to pick up the kids and I get there and I'm with them, I forget about all that, you well, know, because I'm just like, well, this I love that I get to pick them up and I love that I get to go in their room and they can show me what they did. And I ask them and I challenge them. I challenge the fuck out of my kids. Not, not to like be anything just to think differently. You know what I mean? Like if they say something some way, I go, no, that what if it's this way? Or I go, Hey, get up there and call out to so-and-so like, we'll like, I'm like, roll down the window. I go ask that guy where he's going. Like just a stranger, like, where are you going? And they're like, huh? And I'm like, dah, dah. and they're like, why'd we do that, Dad? And I'm like, why wouldn't we do that? Cool. You know, just because of what ifs. This is so cool, man. I'm like, I, I'm not joking, man. I'm gonna like make you're my dad guru now. Like, I'm gonna. I, do you I mind if it. I reach Are out you to you randomly? Crazy? This is the coolest thing ever. Like, There's what? no person on the planet that would see Duncan Trussell calling on their phone that wouldn't be stoked <laughs> to pick it up. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank <laughs> you. This is so good, man. I really hope. And we, I mentioned this on when I was on your podcast. 
I so hope that you write this book, man, because it's like for you, it might see, I don't know what it seems like, but for yeah. someone like a new dad, like me, yeah. this is shit that like, you know, is so useful. Cause my dad, my, my, similarly to Norm, is yeah, that Normie, Normie, similar to Normie. My dad was more present in my life and he's a wonderful, wonderful man, but there was some, um, as many fathers that were in Vietnam, you know, there's yeah. some stuff yeah. and like. I, I don't have like I I'm I'm really like playing it like I'm spitballing so to speak when it comes to being a dad and yeah. I don't want to spitball you yeah, know yeah. what I mean like I like so I just think a lot of people like me need people like you because also I don't need some sanctimonious motherfucker who's like blurting out some moral like corrective Bill O'Reilly style bullshit about how to be a good dad or some hyper masculine motherfucker like talking about it. Somehow you're like balancing all of your comedic skill and your talent in with this way of conveying like fatherhood. It's really bad. Ah, thanks, man. I appreciate that. How can people find you, Mr. Larson? Uh, J. Larson Comedy on Instagram and Facebook. J. Larson Comedy dot com. My podcast, The Through Line. You can get on all your podcast venues. What do you call it? Oh, I don't. I have no idea. You know what I mean. All the podcasts. If you venues. listen to podcasts, you know where. Just look for the through line, THRU, and they can listen to your episode that you did with me. Why did I think your podcast was called The Crab Feet? That was. I did that for a long time, but now it's just, that was with me and Ryan, and now it's just me doing the through line. Cool, man. Yeah, man. Cool. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Jay. All the links you, to find buddy. Jay are going to be at DougAtDrussell.com. Thanks, I'll buddy. see you again soon. Yeah. Much thanks to Jay Larson for coming on the show. Definitely listen to his podcast, Through Line with Jay Larson. And much thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this episode of the DTFH. Don't forget, subscribe to us.